Hi, I'm James Verdeer, and welcome to the American Institute of Biological Sciences Bioscience Talks, which is a forum for integrating the life sciences. Before we begin today, I wanted to mention that I'll once again be teaching our online Writing About Research for Impact and Influence course, which is starting the week of August 7th. Uh, the basic idea behind the course is to help scientists improve their outreach and professional writing with a real focus on preparing publication-ready pieces that are able to influence policymakers, other professionals, and members of the general public. The six-week program consists of a weekly lecture, an assignment, and then there's a chance for us all to get together to workshop in Zoom and discuss your work. I've really enjoyed teaching past versions of this course, and I hope you'll join us for this one. I'll go ahead and drop a link in the show notes for that. Moving on to today's business, for this episode, I'm joined by Dr. John Van Stan, who's an associate professor at Cleveland State University in the Department of Biological, Geological, and Environmental Sciences, where he runs the Wet Plant Lab. He joined me to talk about rain, and specifically the value to science and to scientists of spending more time out in that kind of inclement weather. I'll let him explain. Let's go to the interview. Thank you very much for joining me today. Oh, thank you very much for having me. I'm really excited to chat with you today about our new article. Okay, great. So we're going to be talking about rain today. Um, and in particular, I thought we might start off with a little bit of a chat about the way that rain is often studied today. Um, so can you kind of give us an overview of, of how scientists are mostly looking at rain or other precipitation and its effects? Sure. So, of course, back in the day, uh, before all the technology that we have now, people would have to go out and sample it themselves. So they oftentimes got caught in the rain or they oftentimes had to walk through uh, snowy mountains to get the snow. And, you know, in snow, it's uh, even more complicated. You have to bring that snow back and melt it and see what the snow water equivalent is of rain to turn it into a similar unit. So there was a lot of personal experience back in the day. And I'm talking, you know, before maybe the 1980s, 1990s. There was a lot more personal experience of ecosystems during storms or before storms or immediately after storms. And around the 80s and 90s, we start to see a lot more remote sensing. So in other words, putting out technology that allows us to see things without being there. And that includes things like soil moisture sensors or rain gauges that have buckets inside them that reach a certain volume and start tipping. And then it sends those tips, those tip counts to scientists. And especially lately, we've had, um, you know, say satellite imagery and remote sensing from the skies. So as we go through uh, this technological innovations, this technological revolution, we start experiencing our systems during rain, snow, fog, what have you. Um, and, and we are start experiencing it technologically. And um, th this is based off of like a, a book project we're working on. And so this is actually based off like a, a, a chapter in the book and um, where we talk about hermeneutics, where Hermes used to beam um, information about the God's will about nature to people in their dreams. And I like to liken uh, the way people are looking at natural systems today as a new Hermes, a technology that beams from the skies, you know, this information that uh, would have been beamed to ancient Greeks in their dream state. But maybe our dream state now is the safe, comfortable office space where, you know, the data is literally beamed from the clouds, just like Hermes used to do. Okay, so we have this system in which we're now getting this information beamed to us. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, before we jump into uh, what's lost by doing it that way, potentially, why don't we chat a little bit about the types of things that, you know, this research informs, this, this data, however we might get it, uh, tells us what science does it enable? You know, why are we looking at precipitation and rainfall? You know, what kind of fields does it inform? Ah, so looking at precipitation, looking at rainfall, snow, and what we call occult precipitation, which could be things like uh, mist that sensors don't pick up or fog or cloud water. Um, this informs uh, almost all of natural sciences because water is a critical resource. And the primary way that ecosystems get their water recharged, of course, comes from the sky. And so when we have rainfall or snow coming in, we have a new supply of fresh water. That means that when we're looking at plant ecology, the plants rely on that fresh water and how they 
partition, how they uh, cordon off certain portions of water to take some up in their leaves, uh, whether they drain some to the surface, whether they take it up in their roots, whatever happens, that means that it informs plant ecology. It also informs animal ecology because a lot of animals drink what we call free water. Now, free water is essentially water from precipitation that pools in different places, right? And it also informs microbial ecology because the microbes that are sitting there in the soil or on a leaf or on an animal in its skin microbiome, wherever it's sitting, um, there is limited amounts of moisture and that can control what types of microbes live where. It also informs the way nutrients cycle because a lot of nutrients are cycled when water is available. And even though nutrients are being cycled all the time at some rate, at some place, we have some areas in uh, forests or in deserts or wherever, uh, which, you know, deserts do get some precipitation here and there, right? Uh, but we have uh, these systems where uh, when rain arrives, it can be a really rapid kind of stirring of the system, right? The water as it flows through, it provides a necessary uh, resource for a what we call a hot moment. So we can have a lot more of a nutrient being cycled at a certain time, say in storms, than it would be any other time. And then that rain may be redistributed or that snow may be redistributed in a certain way so that one area, one small area gets a lot more of that water. And thus that small area is not only say having an increased rate of cycling, but also it is uh, a, a hot spot where that increased rate of cycling is really, really important. So scientists who used to wander out into the woods used to be able to personally experience and see and get their attention caught by things happening. And they could say, ooh, what's going on in that specific spot, which could be really important for the entire ecosystem. Okay, and that's you know something that you wouldn't necessarily be able to capture if you were only looking at these data streams. I mean, you know, looking at the remotely sensed data seems very appealing to me as you know somebody who doesn't like to get rained on a whole lot. <laughs> uh, but, but you miss something doing it that way, correct? That's correct. And, uh, and one of the things that I think we also see with people avoiding storms and, you know, there are some legitimate reasons to not go out in storms because it can be hazardous. And in fact, it's uh, in many ways encoded in possibly our behavior, right, where we want to avoid potentially dangerous situations. And so, um, unfortunately, I think we've somehow at some point in time coded all storms as dangerous <laughs> to justify perhaps not going out. Or, you know, to justify a, uh, a feeling of avoidance, uh, not wanting to get wet, not wanting to deal with the, the inconveniences of storms. Okay, so, you know, do those remotely sensed data give us anything that we wouldn't get from walking around and, you know, kind of taking samples manually? Is there, is there a benefit or are we just missing something by it? Oh, yes, there's definitely a benefit to remote sensing, uh, to remote sampling, you know, having equipment that can sample for you uh, so that you don't have to be out there. And, you know, there are some uh, observations that we just simply can't get with our uh, our human sensory system. There are also just some uh, sampling regimes, right? The amount of sampling and uh, over a certain amount of time that we just can't really do with humans. And uh, we could, but I think that there, it might violate some labor laws. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but, but the idea is, is that um, there needs to be a partnership there, right? We don't know where to put samplers. We don't know oftentimes where these say hot spots or hot moments are if we're not out there looking at them and being uh, inspired to monitor them. And so one of the big problems of remote sensing being a predominant way of studying nature is that we can end up putting sensors out in places that just, it can give us information and it might be valuable. It can give us samples and they might be valuable, but um, they might just be providing information on spots that aren't doing something as interesting as other locations. Okay, so could that be a case, you know, in which, for instance, if you had a soil mo moisture sensor uh, in the ground stuck right at the base of a large tree versus 20 feet away out in the middle of a meadow, you, I mean, would you get different results? 
Ah, so this is a great question because you could or you couldn't, right? right. Uh, some trees, for example, will generate a lot of water right next to their stem, right? They're, we call this stem flow. It's when it rains across the canopy and the outlying portions of that crown, that, that, that forest crown, that tree crown, will drain water down the underside of their branches, actually. They kind of seem to defy gravity. They're not defying gravity. They're just using surface tension to hold on. But those, those rivulets of water will then drain down to the stem and then all the way down to the base of that stem. And you can get a substantial volume of water. And it can look like, compared to the open, 100 times more water is flowing through that soil. But there are some trees that don't intercept water that way. And we can get practically nothing showing near a tree stem. We can get less than 1% of the total water across an entire tree canopy will be drained to the stem and it looks like a really dry spot. So having a sensor, if we were to go out into the field and stick a soil moisture sensor right next to a tree without having looked at what that tree does with the rainwater, well then we could get drastically different results, either a substantial boon of water or very little at all, and then we can get totally different perspectives on what that tree is doing compared to the open. One perspective, it's evaporating a ton of water or something, or uh, another perspective, it's concentrating it somehow. And there is a story associated with this that I think might be interesting. Sure. When we first started realizing that um, the rain under trees, or snow under trees in particular, was, was very different, uh, which you know, that was something we had to realize at one point. People started asking, uh, and this was early uh, German kingdom times, right? The, the Germans started asking their king <laughs> for money to measure the rain under the trees. And the king gave them the money, of course, and they went and put a gauge under the tree and they realized that, well, they saw a drip point. They saw a spot where too much water was coming out of the canopy. It was more than what they were measuring in the open. But really, it was just a drip point. There was just canopy area capturing some rain and draining into a spot. Well, they were like, are canopies making rain? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, they're like, where's this extra water coming from? And then they had to deploy more gauges. They had to go spend more time out in the field. And over the 1800s, they started realizing, oh, wait, there's a, there's a really interesting pattern here. And um, unfortunately, a lot of that literature and those stories got lost during the World Wars. But uh, we're reconnecting with some of those now. Oh, that's uh, that's a pity about the lost data. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering then, you know, what value then do we get by going out into the storm? You know, what types of things are we able to learn that we wouldn't be able to otherwise learn by actually getting out there? Ah, well, there's tons of things. Uh, we could start with just the water. And so uh, that story about stem flow, for example, by just being out there, we can get an idea of where these wet spots are going to be generated, or at least the likelihood that they'll be generated at a spot beneath, say, a drippy point where a branch can look like a small faucet, right? Or uh, we could see if there's a tree that has a substantial amount of water flowing down its stem. Um, and then we can also take a look at, um, say, things in the soils. We can take a look at the soils and see well, where are there puddles forming? And where there are puddles forming, that might deprive the soils of a certain amount of oxygen. It might create anoxic conditions. Well, in those conditions, if the right microbes are present, we might also see really cool things in the puddle. One of my favorite things that you can see in a puddle uh, that indicates, say, enhanced nutrient cycling and indicates a special type of bacteria or so, right, is when you see it looks like in a natural forest, the top of a puddle might be shimmering like oil, like an oil sheen. But if you tap that oil sheen, it'll break apart into small little shimmering pieces. And that's an indication of iron oxides. And thus, we might be able to see these puddles where enhanced cycling is going on by looking for these shiny puddles. And that iron is really important for other nutrient cycles. So, because the iron's not just being cycled itself, there's also carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus and sulfur all uh, associated with that. And then I'll say one more thing that's really interesting, that's not say just plain uh, visual, but you can also smell things like um, sulfur releases from soils. 
you can smell things like the smell of fresh rain. That's actually a compound that's released by a certain microbe. And it seems that that compound that's released by these microbes can attract other organisms to help that microbe do things. So you can follow your nose, you can follow your eyes, you can hear certain things, of course. In fact, the sounds that are created indicate really dynamic energy conditions. So there's a lot that one could experience with their human sensory system that could inform where to place sensors. That's fascinating. And I'm, I'm wondering now, is it ever difficult to integrate, you know, those types of um, occasionally, you know, qualitative data with the things that you might receive from your remotely sensed data? Is that a challenge or is it does it work pretty smoothly? Uh, yes, that is a challenge because I think uh, the qualitative data that we get from our um, from our eyes and ears and nose and so on, that qualitative data isn't necessarily a number. Right. And so that qualitative data doesn't right. fit into a model. Also, that qualitative data is not an equation. So you can't revise an equation with just that qualitative experience. However, we have uh, great imaginations. And that's one of the things that helps us to turn our qualitative experiences into things like equations or into things like methods to get numbers. And so that's where the challenge lies, is in taking those qualitative experiences, transforming them with your imagination into an idea. And that idea could be something like, well, uh, I am looking at this uh, branch and this leaf, and I can see how much water is being stored on this leaf. Um, I can come up with a formula, right? And I can say, well, maybe there's about a tenth to two tenths of a millimeter that's stored on this leaf. And I, now I have a number and I can put that into models. That's generally what people did when they didn't go out in the store and they just thought about it in a dry sense. So that number tends to be rather low, <laughs> but uh, you could also then come up with, um, you'd also then come up with methods. And some of those methods could be, oh, I see that there is a interesting pattern of rainfall reaching the soils. We have drips and dry points and so on. How do I capture that? And then you can design a method, and that's where that creativity and imagination comes in to help you to capture those patterns and to put them into models. And you know, I, I think talking about models, uh, one of the things that was mentioned in the articles that I thought was you know really an interesting point was the fact that uh, if you don't get out there and do this right, you wind up risking you know uh, the integrity of those Earth systems models with potential un, you know implications for the way that we understand things like a change in climate. Um, could you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. So all of our models really just represent, and I don't mean just in a in a pejorative term, but these models they represent our theory. Right. And in fact, uh, the reason that models represent our theory is because they can be written in a language that is it's not always perfectly clear, but it's clearer than a lot of our uh, our typical language ways of, of expressing ideas. It can be codified right in programs and it can be exported to different places. We can try and apply these hypotheses that are represented in models. So when we come up with an equation, or when we come up with numbers to feed these models, if we're not careful, well, then we can kind of feed this theory with something that will have it create a um, not as accurate or precise prediction, or models are also used for estimates of things that we have a hard time seeing ourselves. For example, global temperature, right? Or for example, uh, global precipitation patterns. We can't measure all of that at the same time and you know in every place and get perfect representations so we have to use models and theory to fill in gaps so if we get it wrong we can end up biasing our uh, or or uh, introducing error into our estimates of things now into our projections of things in the future but also we use our models to look backwards in time and try to understand our past so when we use models that way, say in like geologic models or for example, for that example, uh, well, then, well, then we may misunderstand our past as well. And so uh, it's really important for us to be uh, creative and thorough and to have experiences in our system so that we're more certain 
<laughs> we'll never be a hundred percent certain, right? Right. But so that we're more certain that we're getting uh, representative numbers, right? So we're not just looking at drippy spots or dry spots in a forest, for example, or that we are uh, getting good theory. So, for example, like we're not sitting in a dry office imagining that a leaf can only hold 0.1 millimeters and then saying all trees are just leaves. And so all forests are just leaf area times some number, right? Because that results in essentially an underestimate of how much rainwater uh, forests can store. And as a result, that, uh, that underestimates the amount of evaporation that occurs that underestimates the change in the color of the canopy, which we call albedo. Um, and that means that we can essentially miss some kind of evaporative cooling effect. And so for a specific example, that means we could en end up underestimating, uh, say, uh, regional and global temperatures. Right. That makes sense. And I'm wondering now, we've talked a little bit about the benefits for the research of getting out in the rain, uh, but let's talk a little bit about the potential benefits for the researcher, whether that be, you know, uh, young researchers or senior researchers. Uh, what types of, you know, effects does it have on the scientists to get out there? You know, is there uh, a creative kind of um, benefit that occurs? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I think that there's an intrinsic value to individuals being out in their system. Um, in fact, there was a great quote from one of the other co-authors on the paper uh, as we were celebrating the acceptance of the manuscript. Um, this guy, uh, Ethan Gutman at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, he goes, in order to be outstanding in one's field, one should be outstanding in one's field. <laughs> Right. That's fantastic. <laughs> I love it. And, and um, I think that it provides a lot of opportunities for inspiration because a lot of this imagination of what we should do when we're in the field, it comes from something generally called intuition, right? And so as you're watching nature work in all different types of uh, settings, right, and in all different types of conditions, you're really training your intuition to have a better guess on where to put things or where to look. Um, and that intuition can help you find um, inspiration, right? That intuition helps you find inspiration uh, to guide your research. And I think that that's a critical piece, you know, whether you're a modeler, right, which is great, whether you're a field scientist, of course, especially if you're a field scientist, right, or you're a lab scientist. Getting out into your system and experiencing it directly is going to build intuitive um, an intuitive understanding. Absolutely, and I should mention that you know that's very well captured in the article, which I you know recommend to everyone to read immediately. Um, it's it's also an incredibly well written article. I should mention it captures with I think you know really exciting language um, a lot of the concepts that we're talking about today. Uh, I, a question I had was you know we have a lot of co authors here on this article, and, and you know one thing that I always wonder as a layperson who is not involved in you know major you know research collaborations is you know how do you get to know all of these people and and what brought this article about. So thank you. Um, yeah, so all these people represent different um, different specialties in the natural sciences, and they all work in some way on forests. So over my career, I've reached out to a lot of different labs because one thing about being uh, primarily a hydrologist, which I'm mostly a hydrometeorologist. Some people call me an eco-hydrologist. But part of being a hydrologist is following the water and seeing what happens with it. And as I followed the water in storms, I noticed a bunch of different things. And I got in touch with various people who have the expertise and background to explain these things to me. So over 15 years, I suppose, uh, I've gotten in touch with a lot of different people. For example, there are geologists on this paper who uh, study how water over long times and other processes too shape landscapes. And so I've had lots of conversations with them. There are microbial ecologists who I've talked to a lot about, well, water's going into the soils here or it's being absorbed by you know the tree here. Are there microbes involved in this? There are also plant eco, eco ecologists ecophysiologists on here who uh, who I've talked to at length about, well, when the tree takes up this water, what happens to it? Why does it take it up and where does it go? 
And then um, there are like modelers, of course, on here who, uh, as I've come up with ways of uh, ways of quantifying phenomena that I've seen, I've asked them, how do I put this into models? <laughs> right. And so the team is rather broad, but it's full of, uh, of, of people who have helped me to understand uh, the context of all these water fluxes that I've been watching throughout my career. And uh, it, it's they all have contributed different ideas about well, what could you see out in the field? And luckily, we're all a little, we're all a little bit crazy, and so we've all spent some time out in various inclement weathers <laughs> and taken photographs and so on. So that was another part of uh, what everyone brought to the table here. Yeah, and it's come together very nicely. I have one last little question for you that's not necessarily science related, but uh, what kind of rain gear do you like? What what do you use to stay dry when you're out there getting rained on? Oh, <laughs> it depends on the weather. Um, you know, I've got, um, man, let's see, what do I have? Okay, so if it's a really cold day, I do have like a really nice like Patagonia uh, jacket and rain pants and stuff. Uh, that I, I will use. And um, I've got some nice North Face stuff. But if it's a nice day and it's raining, I don't really mind. I just get soaked. I just wander around. I might wear just a hat because one thing I've noticed is that um, as much as I love to try and rely on various senses, my eyes are my primary sense, can't help it. And so a hat to just uh, allow the water to drain off the sides <laughs> and not get in the way. And also, sometimes I'll bring a big hat, which looks, uh, I call it my, my dad fashion hat, you know, and, uh, and that way I can have my phone under it <laughs> and take pictures or videos of, uh, of different wet phenomena. But uh, so on a good day, just a hat. Well, and regular clothes. I'm with you 100%. You know, I, I think on any day, at least in the summertime, I'd much rather just get rained on than get sweaty underneath a raincoat. Uh, but yes. yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Anyway, uh, thank you very much for joining me today. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. It's been fun. And that concludes this episode of Bioscience Talks. Just a reminder, the journal Bioscience is published by Oxford University Press on behalf of the American Institute of Biological Sciences and is made possible by the support of our members and donors. Thank you, and talk to you next time.